what we're doing is we're getting set up to do um, a, a Veterans Day special. Actually, we're calling it Armistice Day because we're reclaiming Armistice Day. Uh, this is part a, of a uh, Veterans for Peace campaign they've been doing for a number of years years now, but we're picking it up in Oklahoma City. I'm Rena Gay. I'm with Just Future, and um, my colleague here is James Branham. He's with the Objector Church and the Oklahoma Objector Community. We are both based in Oklahoma City, and we are just still working out some technical details, but we're going to play some music, listen to some poetry, and do some reading and just commemorate the day and basically call for uh, call for for this day be, being a, a remembrance of the horrors of war and not the glory of war and to refocus ourselves on fighting for peace. Okay, so um, we're about at the 11 o'clock mark. I have actually 10:59. Uh, so I just want to reintroduce um, reintroduce us. Uh, I'm Rena Gay. I'm with Just Future and the Oklahoma Objector Community. James is uh, the uh, also with the Objector Church and the uh, director of or like the senior pastor of the uh, Oklahoma Objector Community, which is a uh, a, a congregation of the Objector Church, which is based in. Oakland. Uh, so we are, uh, what we're doing is uh, commemorating the 11th day of the 11th month, the 11th hour, and the significance of that is, um, was originally after World War I, uh, which was an ex just an unprecedented war in terms of its brutality and scale, and just everybody at that point just could not imagine ever doing anything like that again. And the um, uh, really, there was a, a, a wide, widely popular movement uh, for peace and for abolishing war. And so Armistice Day was created by the U.S. Congress to, uh, to call for, uh, for peace. And uh, it was changed uh, later to Veterans Day, and I'm going to read you a little bit about that in a bit, but um, that's what we're doing. We're marking that uh, original Armistice Day in our hashtag. Um, so uh, I wanted to give James a, a, an opportunity to just explain what the Objector Church is. The Objector Church, we are a religious humanist community dedicated to the cause of peace and social justice. We try to be a home for people that may be turned off of more traditional forms of spirituality that may say, hey, I don't know if I believe in God or not. That's not a problem for us. We do want to have a place for people to explore big questions of ethics, meaning, morality, identity in a safe and supportive place. We also, a key part of what we're about is peace and social justice. We see that as being a key part of what it means to be human is to be aspiring and working for those values. Um, also, I'll just mention that the Objector Church, one of the things we do besides our work on, on uh, in, in religious humanism, uh, also the peace side of it, we have several projects that we sponsor. Most notably is Courage to Resist, an organization that works for the rights of conscience objectors, war resistors, and whistleblowers. Here locally in Oklahoma, though, our group here, we have a couple of big projects we work with. The Center for Conscience in Action, which mo mostly works on military law issues. And then, of course, Just Future, which is the project that's doing this event today. Okay, James, I don't know if you got my memo about a candle. Did you? Yes, I have, have a candle. So let's light a candle now, and that's just, you can explain the significance of that. Yeah, uh, cho chose to use a candle for this because often in a lot of different um, spiritual traditions, candles have been very significant, and it's something that's as close as possible to more of a universal symbol. It's not tied to one tradition, but today, Lighting this candle, what we're really thinking about is we're thinking about all those who have been lost in the tragedy of war, all those who have been lost, who never should have been lost, but also we're thinking about the hope of what could be, of a world without war, 
a world without violence, a world where human beings treat each other like brothers and sisters rather than enemies. So we're lighting this candle as an expression of our hope and also, also as an expression of our remembrance of those who have been lost and those who've been lost so needlessly. All right, thank you. Um, and since you're talking about a symbol, I uh, meant to mention earlier that it, with the original Armistice Day, the symbol that was used was the poppy. And it's a red flower that was, it was, I believe it was predominant on the fields where the battles were fought. And so it had a lot of significance to the, to the veterans. And um, I can actually remember back in the 60s, probably around maybe 64 or so, yes, I'm that old, uh, I, as a child, I was given a, a little paper poppy. The, the veterans of World War I would, on Armistice Day, would go out and give these little um, paper poppies to the public just as a way to encourage them to remember uh, and to work for peace. And so I remember getting one of those poppies when I was a little girl and even that was, I was really too young to understand what, what it was about, but I do remember getting that. And of course, once those World War II veterans sort of all, you know, passed away and weren't uh, that engaged and the, the Congress in its wisdom had changed the day to Veterans Day, that sort of died out. But as part of this effort, we're, we're also trying to bring back the poppy. <laughs> so let me, what I want to do is read, I talked about this campaign being part of Veterans for Peace um, effort. So I'm going to read their statement uh, about why they're doing this, okay? So I'm going to be reading from paper, so bear with me here. Um, Veterans for Peace has been celebrating Armistice Day almost since the organization's inception, with a few chapters doing yearly events. However, in 2008, the effort became a national effort with the passage of an official Veterans for Peace resolution. Since then, chapters across the country have been re reclaiming Armistice Day, pushing the celebration of peace into the national conversation on Veterans Day. Over 100 years ago, the world celebrated peace as a universal principle. The First World War had just ended and nations mourning their dead collectively called for an end to all wars. Armistice Day was born and was designated as, quote, a day to be dedicated to the cause of world peace and to be thereafter celebrated, close quote. After World War II, the U.S. Congress decided to rebrand November 11 as Veterans Day. Honoring the warrior quickly morphed into honoring the military and glorifying war. Armistice Day was flipped from a day for peace into a day for displays of militarism. Veterans for Peace has taken the lead in lifting up the original intention of November 11th as a day for peace. As veterans, we know that a day that celebrates peace, not war, is the best way to honor the sacrifices of veterans. We want generations after us to never know the destruction war has wrought on people and the earth. Veterans for Peace is calling on everyone to stand up for peace this Armistice Day. More than ever, the world faces a critical moment. Tensions are heightened around the world, and the U.S. is engaged militarily in multiple countries without an end in sight. Here at home, we have seen the increasing militarization of our police forces and brutal crackdowns on dissent and people's uprising against state power. We must press our government to end reckless military interventions that endanger the entire world. We must build a culture of peace. This Armistice Day, Veterans for Peace calls on the U.S. public to say no to more war and to demand justice and peace at home and abroad. We know peace is possible and call for an end to all oppressive and violent policies and for equality for all people. So I just thought that was really a great um, explanation of what had happened and what we can do to, to fight back and to restore the original principle of the 11th day of the 11th month at the 11th hour. So um, World War I, as I mentioned, was really um, horrific. And if you can begin to cue up the, uh, the poem. The, yes, I got it ready. Okay. Um, uh, it was a hor horrific war, uh, but one good thing that came out of it was some fantastic anti-war poetry. 
And as usual, during times of conflict and, and unrest, art really saves us from complete insanity. And uh, Wilfred Owen was a British uh, soldier uh, who fought in World War I, and he was a fantastic poet and arguably actually gave birth to uh, modern poetry. And um, his most famous po poem is Dolce et Decorum Est, which is Latin. It means it is right and honorable to die for one's country. Um, rough translation. But this is uh, 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 this famous poem read by uh, actor Kenneth Branagh. Dulce et decorum est. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. Gas. Gas! Quick, boys! An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin, if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie, dulce et decorum est, pro patria mori. That's a very powerful piece, read very well. <laughs> um, and it leads us really to talk about um, uh, resistance and counter or, or and conscientious objection uh, by people in the military and veterans. And James is an expert on that topic. So um, give us just a quick history of that, James. And um, we're going to talk a little bit later about how people can get more involved in that. But just give us a little background. Well, I'm going to give you the two-minute version, which will be tough because it's a big, big topic. Um, throughout all wars, they all fundamentally involve ordinary people saying, I'm going to do what the government tells me to do. Um, and there's a lot of lies that are told to get people to do that. Um, but in the end, most people march off to war when they're told to march. But, but not all do. And that's where the... The, myth, the purpose, this is where conscious objection and war resistance comes in. And this is when members of the military reach that point of saying, I can't do this anymore. It violates my conscience. It violates my fundamental of who I am, what I'm about. By the way, we're having some bad weather here. The power is flickering a little bit. So, Rena, if, if my power drops, I think it's, I'm going to make sure real fast that you're set to be a host. Okay, so I think my power was also flickering, but we'll we'll hopefully be able to carry on. Okay, so I have to set you up as a co-host, so hopefully if one of us power okay. drops off, we'll keep going. If not, though, if we both drop out, we'll, we'll see you later on. But anyway, we'll right. continue with the hopes that maybe the power will, will stay on. Um, so anyway, um, throughout U.S. history, 
we have examples of service members who have said no, who have reached their breaking point. Um, in some points in time, there are provisions for conscientious objection, and this it, everyone thinks about it being in the context of drafts, but it also is in the context of people who are in the military who've had a change of heart, change of conscience. And in some points in our history, there have been provisions allowed for service members to be discharged in the military because of conscience, and provisions for draftees to not be drafted for reasons of conscience. At other points in history, there were no such provisions, and so many people went to prison rather than fight. Um, and some of those people died in prison, and that's a, a whole other another story. Um, there are also cases of those who refused to, to fight in various times in our history, who were even executed for, the, for their beliefs. Um, but as a community with the, for uh, the Objector Church and some of the groups we work with, we believe it's very important that service members do exercise their own conscience, and so that's why we, we work for, for, for them. I also will mention that this is not just a purely abstract issue it's or a personal issue. It can change things. In the Vietnam War, arguably the ground war in Vietnam had to end because towards the end, Nixon could not count on his own troops to uh, fulfill the missions. And so our argument is, is that by encouraging the exercise of conscience, our hope is that it will undermine the very foundation of war and that someday if you don't have soldiers, you can't fight wars. And so our goal is to work for the world, the, the time when there will be no war. Okay, thank you. Um, and there are several organizations that, that work in this regard. Uh, our uh, Objector Church uh, and its sponsor uh, and its, its sister organization, Courage to Resist, James mentioned, and we'll be mentioning a few more at the end, uh, things that, you know, organizations that you might want to get involved with um, if you decide you want to um, uh, abolish war. So at this point in the program, we were going to play um, another song, uh, Joan Baez, Where Have All the Flowers Gone? But in the interest of, um, my, you know, or in, in concern for us losing power, I'm going to skip that, James, and I'm going to go ahead and um, to the next item. It, it's I'm going to read uh, a poem. Um, it's by Fred Norman, who is uh, with Veterans for Peace Chapter 162 in the East Bay. And it's, he, it's for 2016, it's called Armistice Day 2016. And some of the dates and numbers mentioned in the poem uh, refer to that year or, or that anniversary, but it's really otherwise a pretty evergreen um, statement of where we are now as far as our, our, our attitude toward war and, and um, militarism. So this is again um, Armistice Day 2016 by Fred Norman. Tonight we meet again as we have met before, as we have met this night for 10 long years, as our soldiers killed the enemy and the enemy killed them. Death seems to be the goal, truth long ago forgotten. Peace is a lie and we will meet and they will kill and die forever. Their ghostly reminders waiting on our hill, waiting, waiting for us to end the wars. Could the dead here on our hill hear us today? What would we say to them? Would we say, thank you for your service, stand at attention, salute with pride, teary-eyed? Or would instead it be better said to simply say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't do enough to end the wars. I'm sorry I didn't do enough to save your lives. I'm sorry, that is the truth. Thank you for your service, that is just another lie. Thank you, thank you for your service. We say it to the veteran at the mall. In school, we say it to the soldier in the hall. We say it to the uniform, not knowing what it means, but to the veterans on our hill, it seems to thank the honored dead for being dead. 26 so far this year, for being dead, 7,015 years for being dead. Will we give thanks to them forever while their ghosts wait patiently on our hill, waiting, waiting for us to end the wars? 
I say instead, it is better said to simply say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I did not do enough to end the wars. A failure that must be rectified. Peace be made the goal, the truth. War be made, be made unknown, the lie. So I, I really am in awe uh, every time uh, I, I think about Veterans for Peace, of all the things they've done for anti-war activism in this country. Many uh, of them, of course, come out of the Vietnam era, um, but uh, there are other, there are young activist uh, uh, veterans in that organization as well, and other organizations have, have uh, come along also working on um, uh, to resist war organizations like About Face. Um, so, there, those organizations of veterans are really at the, at the center of a movement across the country that's been going on for a long time as we deal with the military in our schools. And that's the counter-recruitment movement um, to, to really uh, give young people who are being approached by uh, military recruiters and basically uh, uh, frequently lied to uh, or having having their their futures uh, misrepresented to them to induce them into joining and the counter recruitment movement seeks to provide a fuller picture and the veterans voices in that movement are are so critical but um, there are other non uh, like James and myself uh, working in the counter recruitment movement, and James is working in Oklahoma City uh, among uh, um, in that movement, and he's going to speak a little bit about what that's uh, all about. What I'll share is that um, that I, I actually uh, the, the phrase I often use is truth in recruiting education, and there's a phrase I think was coined by my friend Chuck Fager. And the idea is providing a counter narrative. In other words, the military recruiters, they're, 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 they're selling military service and they will lie, they will cheat, they'll do whatever it takes in, in many cases to get those kids signed up. And so our job is to provide the counter information and alternative message. And our focus is on truth of saying, look, if you're going to join the military, then you need to know what you're getting yourself into and know the whole story. And so that's where one, the voice of veterans is so critical to speak to young people and to say, hey, this is my experience. But it's also getting down to just the brass tacks of what a young person is actually committing to when they join the military, looking into the details of the contract, the details that no matter what the recruiter promises, they can change your job at any time, they can change your pay at any time, you may be asked to do things that breach your conscience. Also, a very important thing for many young people is that for many young people, they're still sorting out the big questions and asking a 17 or 18 year old to decide for the next eight years that they will do whatever the government tells them to do, even if they later determine that it is morally wrong by their own ethics, their own religion, their own philosophy. By signing on the dotted line, you're saying that I will, that I have to do these things anyway or face the consequences. And so military counter recruitment or truth and recruiting education is really about trying to provide uh, alt alternate information, empowering young people to make good choices. We do have a website where you work for our work here in Oklahoma, but it's where we really try to make it a, a, a one stop shop for a lot of different counter recruitment resources. That website is militaryrecruitingtruth.us, and it's we're constantly working on adding new material there. But it's a good starting point. If you're in a local community that doesn't have a counter-recruiting project, and the reality is most of the U.S. doesn't, the good news is anyone can start a project like this. Uh, we'd love to talk to you about it. Visit the website. But an easy starting point is simply uh, printing out some of the, the materials we have on the resources page. And then leaving those go in, in places where young people might go, such as uh, high schools, if you if you have access to a high school, community colleges, vocational technical schools, but also lots of other places, public libraries, laundromats, um, anywhere you see military recruiting literature, that's where our literature needs to go. So I'll cut it off there, but it's a really important thing. Yeah, and. Um... 
uh, James, I'm, I'm assuming you have a link on uh, that website to the National Network Opposing the Militarization of Youth. Yes. That is a nationwide network of groups like you that are doing counter-recruitment work all across the country um, and sharing resources and, and, and information and really support for each other. Uh, and so you can go to their website um, and find a listing of local groups that might be in your area. And if there's not one in your area, you might want to start one or uh, look to one of the existing groups in your area to bring that, that um, program into existence where you live. By the way, their website is nnomy.org, but I've also posted a link to that in our discussion on Facebook for this event. Right, and that's that's kind of a, a mouthful of a, of a URL to, to try to get people to, to grok verbally um, or orally. So, um, but militaryrecruiting.us will have... Uh, uh, oh, it's militaryrecruitingtruth.us. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, militaryrecruitingtruth.us, very important part of it. Um, so now I just want to, uh, we're, we're getting close to the end, but uh, basically I want to issue uh, some calls to action. And we talked about, you know, some of the organizations that exist. Um, there are, you know, as, as we mentioned, Veterans for Peace, About Face, um, uh, the National Network, and there's uh, War Resisters League, uh, World Beyond War, and many others, and so we uh, encourage you to check those out. But also, the Objector Church is um, is really the the nature of our whole existence is to oppose war, to uh, to support peace and justice. So there's a registry on that website, and um, uh, I'm going to let James explain that. But you can go and and really pledge. Uh, yourself to opposing war. Well, what I'm going to do for that, real quick, let me switch my screen real quick because I'm going to do a quick, super quick walkthrough how to actually. Uh, okay, so I'm going back over. No here. problem. I sort of I, I I popped that on you without. That's right. We're <laughs> without any uh, preface, and it didn't have that in the um, in the program. I just remembered it. Let me make sure this is the share thing. Rena, can you see this? Yes, this I can. Yes. Okay, so here's, this is our website, objector.church. On this page then, go to objector registry right here. So when I click on that, it then takes us to the objector registry itself. And it says, it's a declaration of conscience hosted by the objector church, an interfaith peace and justice community rooted in religious humanism. And the reasons why we ask people to register is, first of all, to assert your moral opposition to war, regardless of your age, gender, or religious affiliation. And secondly, to create a record of beliefs and actions in case of forced conscription, especially if you've been or will be forced to register for the draft with the U.S. Selective Service. So what you do is, as filling out this form, you either check, I am a country objector, I'm investigating it, or I'm not one, but I'm registering my support. And the idea is whatever your beliefs are, even if you're in a transitional point, that's fine. Still record it because there, there are some, it's a whole other topic, but basically showing where someone's beliefs are and how they're evolving is a key part of going through the process and in a conscious objector a hearing in the context, context of a draft, as I recall. From there, then you can add a brief personal statement. You can add your name. We also, we do have some options here um, that you can, if you register, it's a free thing, it's by email. If you're wanting a certificate, things like that, there is a fee for that. But that's really a fundraiser for us, and we deeply, deeply appreciate it. But don't feel like you have to do that if you just, just click the free one if you don't want to spend any money. Anyway, this is a way, though, of recording where you are at this moment in time. But along with this, on the right sidebar over here, you can see below, from here, it gives some information about the draft about the definition of conscientious objection and so and a lot of other information just to help to kind of flesh this out so that if you're saying I don't know if I really am a conscious objector or not this is a good starting point so um, anyway this is um, really encourage everyone no matter your age no matter your gender to do this so one of the key things about this is um, under current case law it looks very likely that the draft ever is called the U.S. government will have to either draft men and women 
or drop the draft altogether. And so our encouragement is for young, for, for young women especially, that you need to do this as well, be prepared in the, in the event the draft is ever called. For older people, there is also some danger of what's called a special skills draft. That's where someone who might be beyond traditional draft age, but say might be an IT professional, or might be a medical doctor, or might have some other specialized skill, the military could always draft based on skill. And so they might be quite happy with someone who is older or who may be out of shape if they're doing some kind of technical thing. And so our encouragement is even if you think, oh, there's no way I'd ever be drafted in traditional sense, I would still argue there's still a danger even when it comes to a special skills draft. So we encourage everyone, no matter your situation, please consider pulling out the objector registry. Okay, and I'm not sure if you actually have already said this because I may have been focusing on the next thing on the agenda, but um, a conscientious objector is someone who obviously will not, refuses to fight in war, right? And the military, there's actually a provision uh, in the rules that the military follow that uh, allows for someone to uh, contend that they are a conscientious objector, uh, objector, and if that is recognized by the military, they, I even if there were a draft, they would, they would um, be, um, uh, they would not be, you know, uh, forced to serve. Also, people that are already in the military, uh, it is possible, you know, that when you get in the military, suddenly, I mean, most, you know, people are young when they go in the military, they don't fully know their own mind yet, and when they're exposed to some of the, the, the truths that, that um, uh, the military puts in front of them, they might then learn that, that this is actually their belief. So it, it's difficult, but it is possible to get out of the military on that, uh, uh, on that status as well. James is an attorney who has worked on that. There's another organization, uh, the GI Rights Hotline, that, um, that assists pe people with that, among other problems they may be having with the military of a legal nature. So um, there, there's really, you know, a, a huge, almost, almost unknown movement uh, uh, to to uh, oppose war, to support uh, those in the military uh, that are, um, uh, you know, want to oppose war. So that's really part of what we're doing um, as an organization, our various organizations, is to make people more aware of that. So I want to uh, sort of bring in this to a close now, I want to uh, thank, um, uh, especially thank uh, James for doing the, the heavy lifting on the technical end of this and getting this all to work fairly smoothly and um, uh, for, for all he does otherwise. And um, I encourage you to uh, find an organization that dovetails with your thinking um, against war and support them, whether it be our organization or one of the others that we've mentioned. Um, so uh, James, we're gonna after, I'm gonna give James a chance to, to um, uh, make a closing statement. I uh, want to be sure to give the websites again. Um, Objector.church was uh, one James mentioned. Uh, my organization is Just Future. You will find that at justfuture.org. And um, uh, uh, just a note, James, at the end, we're going to just, uh, we're going to skip the other uh, songs that we missed and just go right to uh, War, What Is It Good For at the end after you're done. All right, over to James. Well, just one thing I should mention on the issue of conscience objection, one group I really want to plug right now is the, is the Center on Conscience and War. Their website is centeronconscience.org. They are really the, the best organization out there working on conscience issues specifically. And so if you're a mil member of the military struggling with issues of conscience, you're thinking about applying for CO status, contact them, centeronconscience.org. Um, so you know, it's really important to mention them. I want to thank everyone who did it, uh, participate today. And again, we're, we will have this very shortly available um, as something you can watch later. Um, and so I encourage you if, you, if you got to watch it live, great, but please share this afterwards so we can get the word out that Veterans Day is, and is, is really its roots is Armistice Day. And the roots of a celebration. And one thing I want to throw out here, just kind of the close, World War I has been a topic of interest for me for a long time because it's really a, a point in time when the U.S. really went a very different direction. 
we had a long history of imperialism of uh, interfering in the affairs of other countries but in world war one was when we really started to become to rise into being you know quote unquote global power superpower and the, the way that the war was sold towards the end especially was that it's the war to end all wars and if you go to the Oklahoma State Capitol, there's a lot of beautiful art in there, a lot of beautiful murals. But one of the oldest murals in the building, on one wing, there's this picture, a really moving picture, and it was showing it was it was the dead it was dedicated to those from Oklahoma who died in World War One. And what's so moving about that picture is the tragedy of it. Because in Oklahoma, there was such great resistance to the war. We had the Green Corn Rebellion, a time when um, poor white, black, and American Indian folks took up arms against the U.S. government because they did not want to go to fight an overseas war in Europe. The revolution was brutally crushed. There was a lot of repression during the World War I era. And then in that in all this it was sold again and again world war one it may be a terrible war but it's a war to end all wars and then we know what happens next a couple decades later the most horrific war in world history and then more wars and more wars and more wars and so to me armistice day it was it was the celebration of this terrible event the ending of it and the idea that this would be the end never again and it wasn't. And so what we want to do is to come back and say, when will we quit jumping off the ledge? When will we as a society, as human beings, quit jumping off the ledge, quit jumping off to like lemmings saying, because the government tells us to, we must go. Well, what if enough people said no? What if enough people said, no, I will not go? I will suffer consequences as necessary, but I will not kill my brothers, my sisters, those other people on the other side, the, the people that the government says are my enemies are not my enemies. They are my fellow human beings. What would that do? And so this, is, this whole event today is just meant to be a bit of a, of a, of a spark for what could be. Also, though, I want to mention um, as a little parting thing. I know a lot of people may say, is this event intended to disrespect veterans, to disrespect the troops? And I would say no, the exact opposite. I would argue that our country, like many, has said that the troops are disposable. They can be, be used and thrown away. Mm -hmm. And it's not acceptable. Rather, we support those the, the members of the military as human beings, not as soldiers, not in their role as war makers. No, mm -hmm. we support them as human beings and as their, as human beings, their ability to see the world differently and to act upon it. And their individual conscience. Yes, yes, yes. So, so thank you so much everyone for tuning in. I think we're gonna close, um, do we wanna close out on, on, uh, on, on the song? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we will have a song and then we will be closed out. And if you have any comments, questions, please feel free to leave them. Rena and I will be monitoring the, the Facebook thing afterwards. And again, one last thing, um, Just Future. What's the Just Future website, Rena? Justfuture.org. And the Objector Church website is objector.church. So we'll switch. Thanks for watching. Thank you.